Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the insulin receptor. Okay, so we've seen how when the insulin receptor is activated uh, by the binding of insulin to the alpha subunits, uh, what will happen is that the tyrosine kinase domains of the beta subunits that are on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane, those will phosphorylate uh, the tyrosine residues of the opposite beta subunit. Okay, so for instance, oh, I got a picture of this. Where's my picture of it gone? Uh, here it is. Okay, so uh, the um, tyrosine kinase domain of beta subunit 1 here uh, will phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of beta subunit 2 over here, okay? And conversely, the tyrosine kinase of beta 2 will phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of beta uh, subunit 1. Okay, then what happens is an insulin receptor substrate uh, protein comes along and it has a phosphotyrosine binding domain which will bind to these phosphotyrosine residues and usually it's either insulin receptor substrate 1 or insulin receptor substrate 2 uh, which does this. Okay, and then what will happen is the insulin receptor substrate protein has tyrosine residues as well and these will be phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase uh, enzyme domains of the beta subunits, okay? So you'll end up with phosphotyrosine residues on the insulin receptor substrate. Now, uh, we've discussed one entire pathway uh, involving uh, the MAP kinase ERK uh, enzyme. Uh, now we're discussing another pathway, okay? So what then happens is uh, the phosphatidylinositol free kinase enzyme, which has an SH2 domain, uh, the SH2 domain binds to the phosphotyrosine residues on the insulin receptor substrate, this sequesters the phosphatidylinositol free kinase enzyme near the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and it is now free to work on its substrate, which is in uh, the uh, phospholipid bilayer, and its substrate is phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate molecules, and what it will do is it will add a phosphate group onto the alcohol group of the third carbon of the phosphatidylinositol 4,5 bisphosphate molecules, creating phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate. Okay, so we now want to see what is the presence of phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate uh, within the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer going to do. Well, basically, certain proteins can now bind to uh, that PIP3 molecule in, uh, well, molecules, of course, you won't just make one. So certain proteins have domains which are capable of binding to phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate molecules. So let me draw a phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate molecule here. So here's the phosphatidyl uh, group. Uh, then here is our inositol, and now we've got three phosphate groups coming off the third, the fourth, and the fifth carbon of the inositol ring. So let's colour it in so it looks simpler. Okay, so we've got our long chain carboxylic acid groups uh, coming off the glycerol molecule, uh, which is here in green. Okay, and then we've got a phosphate group coming off the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and then we've got our inositol ring, which I'll colour in in blue here six-membered carbon ring where all of the bonds between the carbons are single bonds and all of the carbons have an alcohol group coming off them. Okay, and then finally we have phosphate groups coming off the third, the fourth and the fifth uh, alcohol groups of the inositol ring. Okay, right. Now, uh, certain proteins are capable of binding to phosphatidylinositol uh, 345 trisphosphate molecules. And in order to bind, what you have to have is a special domain known as a plextrin homology domain. Okay, so I'll show this protein here. And it's actually an enzyme, so I might actually give it a little active site here, like so. Okay, so. Basically, there is a special conserved domain which is capable of binding to PIP3 uh, molecules, and this is known as the plextrin homology domain. So this portion in blue of this enzyme, this is known as a plextrin homology domain, or a PH domain for short. Uh, so I'll write out plextrin homology in full for you in a moment. So P 
is for plextrin, and plextrin is spelt like so, plextrin. Okay, so it's uh, a certain protein, basically. So it's named after the protein in which this domain was found originally. So this is a plextrin homology domain. Okay, right. And uh, then, what is the actual enzyme that has this plextrin homology domain? Well, basically, this is phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1. PDK1. So I'll write its full ne name just out here. So PDK1 is short for phosphoinositide. So that's all one word, and that stands. That's been abbreviated to just P. Uh, the D is then for dependent. So phosphoinositide dependent, and then kinase is the K. So this is phosphoinositide dependent kinase one. PDK1. Right, so I'll highlight this in red here. Okay, so in, outlined in red, this is the phosphonosotide uh, dependent kinase 1 enzyme. Okay, now, uh, so the plextrin homology domain binds to the PIP3 molecules, and this has two effects. Firstly, it sequesters the phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 enzyme at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, so it moves it from the cytoplasm into uh, the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, or just under that. Okay, and secondly, it also activates the enzyme, so it now gains its kinase activity, and it's a serine threonine kinase, so it adds phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues within proteins. Now, there is another protein which binds to PIP free molecules, and it's going to be important in our study of the pathway. Okay, so I'll uh, show this on a separate PIP free molecule. So here again is another PIP3 molecule, the glycerol, the phosphate group coming off the third alcohol group of the glycerol, the inositol ring, uh, then with phosphate groups coming off the third, the fourth, and the fifth carbons alcohol groups. Okay, so let's colour this in. We'll do it in a bit more of an interesting order. So here is the inositol ring in blue. Here are the phosphate groups, one, two, three, four of them. Okay, uh, in purple, green is the glycerol molecule, and then finally in orange we have our two long chain carboxylic acids coming off the glycerol molecule here. Okay, right, now let's show another uh, protein bound to this, and again it has a plextrin homology domain. So here is the plextrin homology domain again, the pH domain. And again, it's an enzyme, and this is a very famous enzyme this time. Okay, so I'll highlight the plextrin homology domain in blue again, which is binding to our PIP3 molecule. Okay, and now we'll outline the entire enzyme in orange. Okay, so this next enzyme is an enzyme known as AKT, but it has a more famous name now. This is its old name, and if you read the research literature, this is the name that everyone uses in the research literature. But among students, its more famous name now is protein kinase B, okay, or PKB for short. So this is protein kinase B or AKT, in nice papers will put AKT slash PKB. Right, so now, uh, it's exactly the same principle. What happens is AKT is usually in the cytoplasm, but when uh, the um, PIP3 molecules appear uh, in the inner leaflet of the phospholipid binary, the plextrin homology domain of AKT combines those PIP3 molecules, and it hence gets sequestered at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid binary. However, unlike phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 over here, it does not get activated by the binding to a PIP3 molecule. Instead, it needs something else to actually activate it. And basically, it is activated by the phosphoinositide-dependent kinase. Okay, so this is then going to transfer a phosphate group onto uh, the AKT enzyme. So you're going to stick a phosphate group onto the AKT enzyme. And note that they are nice and close by one another, so this transfer is nice and easy.
Okay, so they're both at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid binary now, and what will happen is the phosphonosotide dependent kinase will phosphorylate AKT, and now AKT will be active, basically. Now, uh, AKT itself is a serine threonine kinase, and this is what is now going to produce most of the effects of insulin within the cells. So we've seen that the, that the effect of growth is triggered uh, by this um, uh, MAP kinase ERK pathway that we've set off, but now protein kinase B is going to be responsible for the uh, movement of the uh, glucose transporter for proteins from storage vesicles into the membranes uh, at um, adipocytes and skeletal muscle cells, and it's also going to be responsible for the commencing of uh, glycogenesis in the um, skeletal muscle and liver cells. Okay, so one thing that we're not going to discuss in any great detail is that protein kinase B is going to activate all sorts of cascades which lead to the movement of the glucose transporter um, 4 into the membrane of adipocytes and skeletal muscle cells. So it is protein kinase B which triggers uh, the recruitment of the GLUT4 proteins into the plasma membranes of adipocytes and skeletal muscle cells, okay? But we're not going to discuss that pathway in any sort of detail. Okay, what we will discuss in a bit more detail is how um, AKT is going to trigger glycogenesis in skeletal muscle cells and also in um, um, liver cells. Okay, so this is occurring in skeletal muscle cells, okay, and adipocytes, and now in hepatocytes and also skeletal muscle cells again, um, we're going to get glycogenesis being promoted. Okay, so... Now in hepatocytes, and again skeletal muscle cells, this other pathway is going to be activated. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, basically, protein kinase B is going to phosphorylate and inactivate an enzyme known as glycogen synthase kinase 3. Okay, so... Uh, in hepatocytes and skeletal muscle cells, the activation of protein kinase B is going to lead to the inactivation. So when you put a line and then a blunt end like this, this means inactivation of an enzyme known as glycogen synthase kinase 3. And for short, glycogen synthase kinase 3 is often abbreviated to GSK3. Okay, so for short, this is GSK3, glycogen synthase kinase 3. Now, what does glycogen synthase kinase 3 usually do? Well, usually, glycogen synthase kinase 3 phosphorylates and inactivates another enzyme. So, let me just draw this out. So, here is the glycogen synthase kinase 3 enzyme. Usually, when it does not have a phosphate group stuck on it by protein kinase B, it itself adds a phosphate group onto uh, another enzyme, which I'll put down here, okay, which is known as glycogen synthase. Okay, so it sticks a phosphate group on here, and this is the enzyme glycogen synthase. And basically, when you stick that phosphate group onto glycogen synthase, this is inhibitory. So this inhibits the enzyme. So the enzyme stops working. So usually, uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3 is inhibiting uh, glycogen synthase. And for short, glycogen synthase is abbreviated to GS. Okay, so if we stick a phosphate group onto glycogen synthase kinase 3, then it no longer works. So it in turn stops sticking phosphate groups onto glycogen synthase and therefore glycogen synthase gradually loses its phosphate groups okay and becomes active so what does glycogen synthase now do when it's active well basically it joins uh, glucose onto uh, a growing glyco um, glycogen train uh, well glycogen polymer 
So, glycogen is this polymer of loads and loads of glucose monosaccharides linked together. And basically, what glycogen synthase does is it will take a glucose monomer here and it will add it onto the glycogen uh, polymer, basically. So it's going to extend glycogen polymers and make them bigger. Okay, so basically it will be taking glucose and adding it onto glycogen polymers. And this process of extending glycogen polymers is known as glycogenesis, the creation of glycogen. Okay, so uh, going back to the big picture then, what's happening at liver cells and skeletal muscle cells? Basically, when protein kinase B becomes active in those uh, skeletal muscle cells and liver cells due to uh, insulin, what will happen is it will phosphorylate and inactivate this enzyme glycogen synthase kinase 3. Glycogen synthase kinase 3 will then no longer add an inhibitory phosphate group onto glycogen synthase, which means that glycogen synthase will be free to be active, basically. So it will start taking the glucose that is coming out of the blood and into the skeletal muscle cells and the liver cells, either through uh, GLUT2 in the case of liver cells or GLUT4 in the case of skeletal muscle cells, and it will add it onto glycogen polymers. So we're remo removing glucose out of the blood and storing it as glycogen polymers, basically. Okay, uh, then we've also seen that the activation of protein kinase B leads to the uh, transferring of these GLUT4 transporters from uh, secrete, sorry, storage vesicles into uh, the plasma membrane, and that occurs in adipocytes and skeletal muscle cells. And in the adipocytes, glucose will then come into the adipocyte and then be converted into fats and stored. Okay. And then we're also getting the activation of growth pathways uh, within these cells. Okay, so we'll be making more adipocytes, more uh, skeletal muscle cells, uh, and more hepatocytes. Okay, so um, that then concludes our discussion of the insulin receptor and the downstream pathways and how they relate to the peripheral functions of insulin.